Well, good morning. Again, I mentioned earlier, my name is Ryan Jeffco, and I serve here as the point, at, at the point Church. I serve here as the pastor of students and families, and it is an honor and a privilege that I get to be before you and to open up God's Word and to study it with you, to glean uh, the interpretation from the Holy Spirit and then to understand the application that it would have on each and every one of our lives here in the mission field of Signal Mountain, Red Bank, Chattanooga, and all over the world. Um, I want to just take a moment and say, you know, on August 11th of this year, Brittany and I will have been married for six years. And we're so thankful for those six years. Well, at least I'm thankful. The jury's still out for her. But uh, for those four years, that means we have been here at the Point Church a signal, and, and we're so thankful for the last four years that we have been here with each and every one of you because you have loved our family and you have been our family for the last four years. Hadley just turning five and Luke just turning three. Uh, the Point Church is all they know. This church is all they know. And it's so wonderful to hear the excitement that they have, not just because Dad is one of the pastors here on staff, but it's exciting that they love coming here because this is their family too. And so from the bottom of my heart, thank you for how you have loved on us, how you've spoiled us, and how you have been there for us through good times and the bad times. As you know, uh, we are expecting our third child, our second son, Samuel, uh, and when Pastor Sam asked me a couple months ago if I'd be willing to preach at this day, I said, as long as I'm not in the hospital, I will be here. And so he's been quite the stinker, our third son, Samuel, already. He's not even here, technically. He has been in a breach position for a, a brief time to where we had to go to the hospital a couple weeks ago, and, and they had to perform what's called an ECV version. Basically, what the, the OB had to do was, was grab my wife's stomach, okay? This is already uncomfortable for me. But he had to grab my wife's stomach while looking at the ultrasound to determine where his bottom was, where his head was. And in this breech position, his bottom is facing down and his head is facing up. Again, he's a stinker, all right? And so the OB looks at my wife and says, hey, I need you to take a deep breath. And I'm like, I'm taking a deep breath. What about me, all right? And so we're both taking a deep breath. And all of a sudden he goes, all right, here we go. Grabs my wife's stomach and begins contorting it just twisting it in all these different fashions and shaking, I'm shaking, she's shaking, Samuel's shaking, everyone is shaking. And then two minutes later, he said, we're good. And I'm like, what just took place here? What, just, what did you just do? And he grabs out the ultrasound and Samuel's head down and he's where he's supposed to be. So I've already determined, as any good father would, as soon as Samuel comes out, he's grounded, okay? <laughs> no passy for a week. And then I'll, my paternity leave, there'll be something with the paperwork, I'll have to come back to work, but I'll expect Brittany to enforce no passy for a week while I'm safe in the confines of my office. But I just want to say again, from the bottom of my heart, thank you for being there, praying for us during this process as we begin to welcome our, our third child. And so the plan is now, unless he decides uh, otherwise, uh, to go in Tuesday night at midnight to be induced and to welcome him uh, fully on Wednesday morning, Wednesday afternoon. So if you would continue your prayers for our family, I would, I would greatly appreciate it. And of course, we will do our best to keep you updated uh, with, with everything that transpires and, and send the pictures out, of course. So... Um, I just want to say thank you to Pastor Sam uh, for the ability to preach here this morning, for him to, to trust with his pulpit while he's at the Little Brown Church down the road and Pastor Richard is down at the Red Bank campus. You got the third string, all right? I'll let you determine if that's a blessing or a curse throughout this message this morning. But uh, if you will, uh, the message that I've titled for today is The God Who Protects. And as you know, we're, in, we're still in the summer. I know it, it's crazy that summer is almost over. Usually by July 5th, it's, it's a vacuum. It's a whirlwind. It's, 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 we might as well be back in school. All right. But we are going to be uh, in Psalms chapter 46 today, and we're going to be covering the first 11 verses. And like I just mentioned, we, I have titled this message, The God Who 
protects. And, and in order to uh, establish why I felt like that was the necessary title, I wanted to give you a couple stories. If you don't know much about me, I grew up in Texas, born and raised in Arlington for the first 13 years of my life. All right, and what if you've never visited Texas before? I I can summarize Texas in in three adjectives, okay, and three uh, meteorological descriptions to let you know what Texas is like. The cities are great, the cities are beautiful, uh, you know, it's a great place to go visit if you like being hot, okay, if you like being in a place that's flat, all right, and if you like being in a place where it's dry. Okay, that's pretty much in a summarization of Texas. It is hot, it is dry, and it is flat. All right. Now, for someone who grew up playing baseball, that was very favorable conditions. That gave me the opportunity to get to play basically 10 months out of the year I got to play baseball. Because once February hit to the end of November, it was, it was great weather for baseball. Okay. But also, what this means, the other favorable conditions, is that it was uh, susceptible to something that is called a tornado. Okay, and so for the months of April through July, tornadoes were very common in Texas. All right, we, we would practice regularly in school drills to prepare ourselves should a tornado watch, which is just meaning that the conditions are favorable for a tornado to form if the tornado watch turned into a tornado warning, meaning a funnel has not only formed, but it's touched the ground, all right, and now it has a path. And so a tornado watch transitioning from a tornado warning means that if you get an alert, Okay, there is a, a tornado potentially coming your way. And so not only in school would we practice these things, but in our home, my parents did a very good job establishing, should a tornado come, this is the room in which we run to. This is what we grab. We grab a pillow, we grab a flashlight, and we will run to the room designated for the tornado, should a tornado come into effect. And growing up, I just, I just assumed this is what everybody dealt with. This is just something that became rather common for me. But my parents did a fantastic job establishing that as long as we are in this room, okay, the conditions around you are the most safe. And I would look to my parents knowing that they are the source of my comfort and my protection because they have provided what I needed to be safe in this storm. Now being married and a, and a father of two, soon to be three, I, I come to figure this out rather quickly. My wife is not a fan of any kind of storm. Okay, she, she experienced a rather traumatic experience growing up in a home that resulted from a thunderstorm, all right? And so anytime we have any kind of inclement weather or any kind of warning, uh, I, I'm there for her to, to, to calm her down and to release the tension and to uh, assure her that we have a strategy, we have a plan to make sure that we are going to be safe to the best of our ability. Now, Luke is a lot like me. He, you know, it doesn't really bother him. It doesn't really affect him too much because it's just not in his DNA to, I guess, necessarily be scared of that. And again, growing up in Texas, I was used to these kind of inclement weather issues. But Hadley, on the other hand, is, is terrified of any kind of storm. Okay, whether it be a, a, a thunderstorm, whether it be a, a lightning strike, whether it be a heavy wind. And, and most recently, you know, we have had some tornado watches, even a couple turn into tornado warnings. And so what we have found in the last couple of years, okay, our daughter in the middle of the night, if in the midst of a storm, it wakes her up, she'll get out of her bed and run down the stairs and she'll come into our room. And she'll come up to us, okay, in the most pitiful, terrified voice, and just say, hey, mom, dad, can I get in the bed with you? And so we'll, of course, make the adjustments and, and, and welcome her in. And then I know as my job, as the, as the husband and the father, the, the protector of our home, I will stay up with her. 
I'll turn on the TV, put on Blue's Clues or Paw Patrol or, or whatever that she wants to watch. Um, she's not a fan of Sports Center yet. Pray for me, okay? But we'll turn on the TV to kind of uh, distract her from what's going on. And over the next five to ten minutes, every time, I notice with our daughter, she starts calming down. What was an elevated heart rate and rapid breathing has now calmed. And by that 10 minute mark, I look over to my daughter, nestled up right next to me, asleep. And what's so interesting about this is it doesn't take 10 minutes for the storm to go away. In fact, majority of the time is the storm is still rather uh, violent, rather uh, uh, severe. But what I've come to realize is that she has now positioned herself in a place where she feels protected, where she feels comfort, and she feels assurance to rest. Matthew eleven twenty eight. Come to me, all who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you what, church? Rest. A promise that in the aftermath of an action that we take to go to the God who protects, he doesn't just say, hey, I I will try to give you rest. I might be able to deliver rest. He says, I will give you rest. And now Brittany and I have the unique privilege of Showing our children that the, the comfort and the assurance and the protection that we have is not in, our, our, in ourselves. But it's in the triune God that we serve. We have the opportunity to present him regularly to them. Until the day that we pray happens. They accept him as their Lord and Savior. To be their comfort to be their assurance and to be their protection this is the God who protects and so as I mentioned I want to invite you to join me in Psalms 46 together with the idea that this God who protects not only protects the little children of this world, but protects all the adults in this room with the simple reminder that there is no storm that you and I could ever experience that would overcome the rest that he offers. There is no storm that would overcome the rest that he offers we need to do is just go to him so psalms 46 we're going to read the first 11 or we're going to read all 11 verses together and then we'll pray and then i'll share with you my takeaway and the three points that i feel like is what we need to share and talk about today all right so psalms 46 titled god is our fortress to the choir master of the sons of korah according to alamoth a song verse 1 God is our refuge and strength, a very present help in trouble. Therefore, we will not fear, though the earth gives way, though the mountains be moved into the heart of the sea, though its waters roar and foam, though the mountains tremble at its swelling. Selah. Verse 4. There is a river whose streams make glad the city of God, the holy habitation of the Most High. God is in the midst of her, she shall not be moved. God will help her when morning dawns. The nations rage, the kingdoms totter. He utters his voice, the earth melts. The Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our fortress. Selah. Come, behold the works of the Lord, how he has brought desolations on the earth. He makes wars cease to the end of the earth. He breaks the bow and shatters the spear. He burns the chariots with fire. Be still and know that I am God. I will be exalted among the nations. I will be exalted in the earth. The Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob 
is our fortress. Selah. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, speak through me today the words that this congregation and myself needs to hear. Lord, we are wanting to understand the interpretation to the best of our ability and apply it specifically to our lives that you have called us to, to the mission field that you have planted us to. For all the glory and all the honor goes to you and your son, Jesus Christ, and what he's done on the cross for our sins. And it's in Jesus' precious name that we pray and all of God's people said, amen. So here's our takeaway, okay? Here's our takeaway. Run to the Father in all circumstances. Run to the Father in all circumstances. You know, typically my kids will run to me for two general reasons. One, if they are sad, afraid, or hurt. The other would be if they are happy and joyful and excited. Now, I wish that I could say every time that my children have run to me, that I was prepared for them, that I was ready to receive them, and I was ready to give them exactly what they needed in that moment. If I do say that, I would be lying. Unfortunately, there have been times where they have run to me in either a place of sadness or pain or joy and excitement to which they have heard their father say, not now. I can't right now. I'm not available in this moment. Hey, come back in a couple minutes. And I try to be as good as I possibly can with them about that, but unfortunately, I fall short. But the takeaway that we are learning right now about run to the Father in all circumstances means that there is a Father who we serve, who we worship, that will never be too busy, that will never be too distracted, that will never be overwhelmed to receive the need that we have and to help us get through it. And so I don't know where you are today with your relationship with the Lord, but do not use the excuse that someone who is your father or someone who is a fatherly ex- uh, Uh, example in your life to be able to say in their shortcomings that must mean the God that you serve will also have shortcomings he won't run to the father in all circumstances and he will be there ready to receive you and what I have found in my life is that when I begin running to the father It doesn't take long to feel his embrace because he's been there very close from the beginning. Now, Psalms 46 is an exciting uh, psalm. It's a very well-known psalm because it was the beloved psalm of the Protestant reformer Martin Luther. In fact, it is said that he would sing this song regularly when he would face times of distress and discouragement. And then in 1529, he composed the song, A Mighty Fortress, because of this very psalm. Now, we are not entirely sure who wrote Psalms 46. Some believe that it was King Hezekiah. Some believe it may have been a scribe or a musician. But what we can always be assured of is this, church. No matter what the human author depicts to us, whether they get, receive a little bit of credit or not, we can always remember That every word, every chapter, every verse, every book is inspired by the Holy Spirit. To where we do not have to worry about those kind of details because we have the opportunity to have a relationship with the author of the greatest piece of literature ever constructed. Now the background and setting of this psalm is believed to be composed after the tragic invasion of Judah by King uh, Sennacherib, all right, Sennacherib, I'm sorry, the king of Assyria, 
All right, during the reign of King Hezekiah of Judah in 71 BC. Now, this story is found in 2 Kings 18 and 19. All right, if you have some time today, if it rains or you just want to stay in, I would encourage you to open up to 2 Kings chapter 18 and 19. This is a fascinating story of not only God's deliverance, but his protection of God's people. But it also confirms that something you hear often from Pastor Sam and Pastor Richard and now myself, that the best commentary for God's Word is God's Word. And how you can begin to piece together the direct correlations of how God uses His Word to affirm His Word. And so again, that story is found in 2 Kings 18 and 19. Um, And so what I would like to do now is to go through these three stanzas in Psalms 46 and share with you the three reminders of why we should run to the Father in all of our circumstances. Let's begin reading verses 1 through 3. God is our refuge and strength, a very present help in trouble. Therefore we will not fear, though the earth gives way, though the mountains may be moved into the heart of the sea, Though its waters roam and foam, roar and foam, though the mountains tremble at its swelling, Selah. Now there's a lot of impact here. In fact, I can, I can make an uh, argument that if we just stuck to the first six words, words of verse 1, we could have a mini-series that would last many months and we would still not even break the surface of the incredible, rich, truth that is found in these first six verses but I want to focus on a couple things with you today to understand the beauty of this now point one is this the Lord our God is our stronghold okay the Lord our God is our stronghold now the word stronghold is used as a synonym to express the importance of refuge and strength and we'll get to that here in a second but what I want to do is if you don't mind putting up uh, verse 1 for me real quick I want to draw your attention to something all right the word God pretty important here because the description that is used in this text for the word God is not God Jehovah and it's not God Yahweh but it's God Elohim say Elohim Elohim great Now, the beauty behind this word Elohim, am I out of school? Yeah. The beauty of Elohim is the description of God is to speak a strong expression that communicates to us God and only God. God and only God. Another noteworthy time of where God is described as Elohim is Genesis 1 1. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. In the beginning, Elohim created the heavens and the earth. God and God alone. Meaning, he had no assistance. The triune God needed no one else, no thing else, to do the wonderful works of creating all that we see here today. And it's a beautiful depiction and a reminder that the same Elohim that created the heavens and the earth is called to be our refuge and strength. God and God alone is our refuge and strength. Now the word refuge here denotes of an importance that he is our high tower. Okay, A strong high tower tower he is meant to be the greatest defense for all circumstances that come into our life in the ancient world when there were wars and uh, strifes that were happening amongst civilization it was considered a great defense to have a high tower because the the soldiers would run into the high tower and use that as an incredible defense to war off their enemies their enemies would not be able to penetrate that high tower and what would be used as a defensive strategy would now be used as an offensive strategy to take care of their enemies. Proverbs 18.10 says this, The name of the Lord is a strong tower. A righteous man runs into it and is safe. Elohim is our refuge and our strength. 
God and God alone is our place of refuge. It's not God and someone else. It's not God and something else is what you need to experience true refuge and strength. It is God and God alone that we need for the true protection in all circumstances. Whether it is something mental, whether it is something physical, whether it is something emotional, or it is something spiritual. The Lord our God, Elohim, is communicating to us that I am all you need. Quit looking to something else that will fall flat and fail. I am the refuge and the strength in all circumstances. And in two, verses 2 and 3, he gives us a poetic language of that there are going to be a multitude of circumstances that come our way. That we will need a defense for. That we will need protection for. But what I want to make sure we understand is that these attacks and the refuge and the strength that God gives us is not an invitation to run from our attacks. Not run from the enemy. But it is a place to remind that he and he alone gives us a place where we can turn and receive the upper hand and face our enemy and overcome it. God does not want us to run from our problems. He wants to be used to face and overcome our problems. Psalms 28, 7 says this, The Lord is my strength and my shield, and in him my heart trusts, and I am helped. My heart exults with my song. I give him thanks to him. Where do you reside for your refuge and your strength? Have you been accustomed to going to someone else, to something else, other than the Elohim, other than God and God alone, for your refuge and for your strength. Because only then can you be protected and then use the defenses of the Lord to overcome all circumstances. Let's continue reading. As we, uh, at the end of verse 3, we see an interesting word, called Selah. Now, it's not entirely confirmed what this word may mean, but what it is confirmed, or what it is believed to mean is two reasons, okay? For a reader, it's an opportunity to pause and reflect. At the end of this stanza, we are invited to pause and reflect. And for a musician in this moment, it is an invitation to begin a, a soft instrumental so the words of the first three verses, the first stanza, can resonate to the audience that is receiving this song. And so the pause and reflection point of this is this simple question. Who or what is your refuge and strength? If it's anything other than Elohim, it will fall short. And what I've come to find in, in my 34 years of life, the simplistic questions like this give us the greatest clarity. To help us calibrate where our safety and security resides in. Let's continue reading Psalms 4 through 7. There is a river whose streams make glad the city of God, the holy habitation of the Most High. God is in the midst of her, she shall not be moved. God will help her when morning dawns. The nations rage, the kingdoms totter. He utters his voice, the earth melts. The Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our fortress. Selah. Point number two, the Lord our God is our source. We've just established that the Lord our God is our stronghold, our refuge and strength in all circumstances, and now he is our source. Now, all great ancient cities were built around rivers, okay? Egypt was built around the Nile. Babylon was built around the Euphrates. And Rome was built around the Tabor. But Jerusalem had no river. It was, it was established on a mountain. And so no mighty river was around it. Um, 
There was the Jordan a long distance to the east. There was the Mediterranean Sea a long distance to the west. So it really had no natural water supplies besides maybe some trickling of streams. All right. Now, during the attack of the Assyrians, believed to be the context for this text in 701 B.C., King Hezekiah, understanding this, began digging a tunnel 1,770 feet to the uh, spring of Gihon that is connected to the city pool of Siloam in Jerusalem. He built this, this tunnel 1,770 feet long, okay, to put it into context from goalpost to goalpost on a football field that's roughly about five uh, football fields in length, okay. Um, and today, that tunnel still stands that you can, if you go to Jerusalem, you can visit this tunnel that King Hezekiah dug out that connects to the Pool of Siloam. Now, unbeknownst to the Assyrians through this irrigation system, Jerusalem, the people of Jerusalem, were able to use this source for nourishment and health in the midst of battle. Now, in verse 4, God is obviously depicted as our river. Okay, God is depicted as our river and our source of three very beautiful things that I want to highlight before we continue. The first source is joy. Look at verse 4 where it says, There is a river whose streams make glad the city of God. God is, designed, is, is going to be our greatest source of joy. Not happiness. We understand that as subjective. We understand that that shifts with the moods that we are in or the circumstances that we find ourselves in. But joy. The Lord our God is the greatest source of joy that we could ever uh, experience. Joy is also found as the fruit of the Spirit in Galatians 5.22. The fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, peace so on. It reminds me of this story in Acts chapter 16 where Paul and Silas are doing the the works of the Lord, healing people, um, and what is their great reward? Prison. They go to prison because of the work of the Lord that they were accomplishing in Acts chapter 16. And while they were sitting in prison in the midst of this time, they began sulking, they began complaining, they began blaming the Lord for their circumstances, right? Right? In fact, Paul looks over to Silas and said, let's begin singing. Let's begin praying to the Lord and singing the hymns that he has put in our heart. Even though our circumstances look very different than what we had planned. There is a joy that exudes from the heart of a believer if they are spirit filled and connected to that source. And because of that joy, because of that source... Not only did the Pharisee and, or the Philippian jailer get saved, but they took, he took Paul and Silas back to his household, and everybody in his household got saved. This is the power of the, the joy that is obtained from the Lord for a spirit-filled person. My question to you is, are we tapped into that joy? The second reminder, the second source is a a firm foundation all right the second source is a firm foundation in verse 5 we were reminded of this god is in the midst of her she shall not be moved this talks about the firm rock on which we stand the firm foundation in which we can stand confidently because of god is the source of our firm foundation isaiah 33 5 and 6 says this the Lord is exalted, for he dwells on high. He will, fi- he will fill Zion with justice and righteousness, and he will be the stability of your times, abundance of salvation, wisdom, and knowledge. The fear of the Lord is Zion's treasure. We can have confidence in the firm foundation in which we stand without any worries of this foundation cracking. We just have to stand on it. You know, we're, we're abundantly spoiled by our, our worship team. Pastor Matt does an incredible job uh, getting this team put together um, to, to unveil the curtain a little bit and give you a little bit behind the scenes. They're here a couple hours uh, early each Sunday practicing and, and working on this, 
on these uh, songs that they do so well presenting to us. The, the audio and tech team are here as well, and we're so spoiled by their dedication and their devotion to providing a worship uh, service that we could give to glorify God. Not only are there adults in our team, but also students. And as a pastor of students and families, that's exciting for me to see. But one of my favorite songs that we sing through this worship team, and we sang it today, is Firm Foundation. And the lyrics, if you are, aren't familiar, goes like this. Christ is my firm foundation, the rock on which I stand. When everything around me is shaken, I've never been more glad that I put my faith in Jesus as he's never let me down. He's faithful through generations. So why would he fail now? He won't. Amen. And the question I want us to ask is this. Have we used the head knowledge of that song that I believe if we were to break out an acapella, and don't worry, I won't lead it, that you would all sing that very well? But the question I want to ask, and again, the most simplistic questions tend to give us the greatest clarity, is that have we transitioned that head knowledge to an application knowledge? To where the audience of this community that we reside in is filled with people who are lost and searching for a Savior are wondering, is this Christ that you claim is a firm foundation worth it enough for me to stand on it with you? We have the greatest opportunity to confirm that in our life through all circumstances. That he is that solid, firm foundation. And there will no, never be any cracks in it. Lastly, he is the source of life. Where there is a river, there is life. The analogy of the triune God being assimilated with water is not uncommon. In fact, it's very regular, regularly mentioned, especially in the teachings of Jesus Christ. In John chapter 4, Jesus is speaking to the Samaritan woman. He says, But whoever drinks of the water that I will give him will never be thirsty again. The water that I will give him will become a, in him a spring of water welling up to eternal life. That was John 4.14. 4, and then in John 7... 37 and 38, if anyone thirsts, let him come to me and drink. Whoever believes in me, as the scripture has said, out of his heart will flow rivers of living water. Are you connected to the source of life? Because today you'll have an opportunity to respond uh, from living a mere existence and beginning a God-fulfilled life here on earth and in heaven forevermore. Are we, are we tapped into the source of joy? Are we tapped into the source of a firm foundation? And are we tapped into the source of life? For the first 18 years of my life, I, I was not. I was bat battle-wounded, scarred heavily. But what I found... That when I was ready to surrender, I found a God who was very close to me, ready to embrace me. To then becoming my source. For not only these things mentioned, but for much more. Have you stepped into that life that God offers each and every one of us? Let's finish these last three verses in the last stanza here. Verse 8 says this, Come behold the works of the Lord, how he has brought desolations on the earth. He makes war cease to the end of the earth. He breaks the bow and shatters the spear. He burns the chariots with fire. Be still and know that I am God. I will be exalted among the nations. I will be exalted in the earth. The Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our fortress. Selah. Last point is this, the Lord our God is our stability. The first two verses in, in verse 8 and 9 are, are, have two different meanings that I want to just hit on really quickly with you. The first meaning is many believe that this is a prophetic, a prophetic message of the second coming of Jesus Christ. We understand that when Jesus comes back, the, all wars will cease to exist and everyone will bow 
to the risen king to the true Messiah. We understand that. We are anticipating that one day. And we believe because we have been given another day on this earth that there is still work to accomplish before that day comes. But we believe that 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 there is a prophetic imagery here as well. But also, the second meaning is that it can correlate to the counsel that King Hezekiah received from the prophet Isaiah. Prophet Isaiah was living during this time and, and he was actually working with King Hezekiah to remind him of the God that we serve and the God of deliverance to his people and that God, has, uh, God is in this and he has not left you or forsaken you. So Isaiah, uh, this, this, these two verses can have a direct correlation to that because in Isaiah 38, 4 through 6, it says, Then the word of the Lord came to Isaiah, Go and say to Hezekiah, Thus says the Lord, the God of David, your father, have heard your prayer. I have seen your tears. Behold, I will add 15 years to your life. I will deliver you and this city out of the hands of the king of Assyria and will defend your city. This not only, again, reminds us the beauty of of the fact that the word of God is the best commentary for God's word. But also this reminds us of the beauty of godly counsel. To be surrounded by like-minded believers that in circumstances that are not favorable to us, in circumstances that are hard and tough, to be surrounded by like-minded people who are pointing you back to the triune God to remind you that He is still next to you. Run to Him. You'll feel that wonderful embrace. This is our responsibility. This is our privilege. But I wanted to close on on verse 10 because this is a very well-known verse um, that I want us to make sure that we don't miss the true meaning of it, okay? Verse 10, be still and know that I am God. Now the term be still in verse 10 literally means in the original Hebrew, hands off. Hands off hands down and it is a beautiful illustration of a struggle that you and I if you're anything like me may have in this life that God has given to us if you're anything like me if I see a problem I'm going to immediately find the solution or I'm going to look for the solution and then administer the solution to the problem and then fix it okay because I know that if whenever there's a problem, there has to be a solution. And God, in his infinite wisdom, looks at me and says, you are correct, but maybe you are not the one to provide the solution. Hands off. Hands down. This is a struggle that you and I can have easily because we want to be a part of the problem when in Ideal, uh, uh, ideally speaking, we have been a part of the problem and we want to be a part of the solution. There's an interesting poem that I want to share with you with this verse. It says like this, With thoughtless and impatient hands, we tangle up the plans that God hath wrought. And when we cry out to the Lord in pain, He says, Be quiet, dear, while I untangle this knot. Hands off, hands down. This is the the problem that I have with that uh, bumper sticker you may have seen called uh, God is my co-pilot. I understand the sentiment behind it that you're wanting to show that people who use this are wanting to show that God is in my life. I have God. The problem is he is never meant to be a co-pilot. He is meant to be the pilot of your life. You need to get in your place in the participant seating, or if you're like me in the cargo hold, and enjoy the ride. Because if we convince ourselves that God is a co-pilot, then we have given permission to have the hand on the wheel and to convince God that we know exactly where we're going. Hands off. Hands down. If we were to measure up your stat sheet versus God's stat sheet, the one who has overwhelmingly, I'll I'll use my stat sheet, okay? The one who has overwhelmingly failed daily and compared it to 
The perfect creator, Elohim, who has never failed. Who do we need to align with when we find ourselves tangled up in our own mess? God and God alone. Job 12.10 says this, In his hand is the life of every living thing and the breath of all mankind. Our place is not at the steering wheel. It's in the hands of God. He closes this beautiful psalm in this way. The Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our fortress. Selah. Now I want to I invite you to understand the, the, this purposeful conclusion at, at the end of verse 7 and the verse 11. Okay, it's, it's meaningful. It's purposely divine why he calls himself this. Okay, The Lord of hosts means the Lord of angels. Okay, We, we get that and we'll come back to it here shortly. But he calls himself the God of Jacob. And if you're unfamiliar with who Jacob is, I'll give you a little uh, summarization. Okay, Jacob was a conniver. He was a schemer. He was the heel catcher. He was a manipulator. He deceived his brother. He tricked his brother, Esau, from his own birthright. And yet in this perfect, infallible text... The God of all creation still calls himself the God of Jacob. And if he could be the God of Jacob, he, 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 he can be the God of Ryan Jeffcoat. And ladies and gentlemen, if he can be the God of Ryan Jeffcoat, there is hope for you. That no matter what tangle you have found yourself in, what, what nasty circumstance you have put yourself in because you grabbed the steering wheel, You should have said, hands off, hands down. There is no storm that could follow you to the Father to where he says, no, not now. I can't right now. I'm running the universe. And he says, come to me, run to me. I will protect you. At the end of the story, the day where the, the Assyrians believed that they were going to finally conquer Jerusalem, the general sent a letter to King Hezekiah and wrote that, hey, the God that you profess, he's not coming, he's not going to protect you, he's not going to do anything to, for you. You might as well surrender. And so he grabs this letter, King Hezekiah, and takes it to the temple, the altar, where he worships God and lays it, lays it at the altar and prays to God and then walks away. That night, the Lord of hosts, the Lord of angels, sends an angel and wipes out 185,000 Assyrians which the general woke up to see the desolation and retreats. This is the God who protects. This is the Lord our God, our stronghold. This is the Lord our God, our source. And this is the Lord our God, our stability. And this is why our Elohim the one who can truly protect. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this morning. We thank you for this time. When I pray during this response that if anybody is here who does not know you, will come to you and surrender. Or we do not deserve it, nor could we receive it outside of your son, Jesus Christ. Let us come to you. Lord, we love you, and we thank you for your son, Jesus Christ, and what he's done on the cross for our sins, and all of God's people said, amen.